Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Digicom Cafe, located here in the beautiful Ozarks of Northwest Arkansas. Uh, this morning, I have a good friend of mine and brilliant antenna designer. I'll tell you what, you've probably seen some of my posts and things on Facebook and my channel on Telegram about this new mag loop antenna that John Fortuna's designed, W6NBC. And uh, so I'm honored to have him in the shack. Actually, truth is, I'm on his uh, Zoom session here. So we're going to record it here. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this presentation and sharing it with you. So welcome to the cafe, John. Thanks for all you do. And take it away. Show us what you're doing with these this wonderful Meg Loop antenna. My pleasure, Denny. All right. I assume you're seeing the screen? Yes. All right. I've entitled this In Search of the Optimum Meg Loop, without the parentheses mark or the quote marks. <laughs> the magnetic loop. Magnetic loops are very common in ham radio these these days, although they uh, they are a newcomer to ham radio. And so there's a lot of ignorance uh, about the magnetic loop among hams. Here we see a variety from a commercial loop, the most popular, the MFJ, in the upper left, down to some other loops, some of which are good, some of which are bad. Almost all of these have some serious flaws in them. But it's a very popular end. Now, but since it was introduced in 1968, and it's become an, an all-time ham favorite, almost every every build-it type ham has built a mag loop. There are many attractive features to the mag loop, mainly its size. An antenna that can compete with a full-size HF antenna, and yet be only four feet in diameter, is definitely attractive to hams with limited spaces. And they're easy to build. You can just go run down to your hardware store and buy pretty much everything you need to build it, or certainly find what you want on, on Amazon. Some hams think that the, that the mag loop is a low noise antenna. Well, yes and no. It's not because of the reasons you think, but I will talk about that. And there are many, many articles out on the internet and in print, popular topics. Unfortunately, because the mag loop is still kind of a newcomer to ham radio, there's much old wives tale about it. And many of the articles written are very poorly written and contain a lot of misinformation. And of course, there are commercial versions, as we know, some of which also are not well designed. In fact, a lot of mag users, mag loop users are disappointed by their loop. They get it. They think it should be better than it is. And probably it could be. But many of them have much more loss than people realize. And some of them are pretty expensive. And even to build one out of the materials most hams think they should build them out of is pretty expensive. And they aren't always easy construction project, projects, relatively easy uh, for if you've got good tool sense, but they're hardly, hardly the newcomer's design. And once you get it built, what are you going to do with this great big awkward loop in your back in your back garden? Because staring over the lens fence is the inevitable neighbor. Don't put that ugly thing in your backyard near my backyard. But I've got good news for you. If you optimize a magnetic loop, and that's not something most people think need to be done, then you'll get a satisfying loop. And achieve, achieving good results is relatively easy because the way to do it is known. But you must optimize as many of the magnetic loop factors as you can for every single loop that you build and, and for every, every situation that you want to put it in. And if you don't optimize the loop in its several characteristics, it will disappoint you because few hands realize that there are far more factors to optimize the magnetic loop than there is for a conventional linear element antenna, like a simple, like a simple dipole. All you got to do to optimize a, uh, an ordinary dipole is what? Cut it to the right length, and then you're done. 
and it's going to be a maximum optimized antenna, but not for a loop. And there is not one loop that fits all the way. Even though the magazine articles try to tell you, oh, buy our loop and you can tune any, everything from DC to daylight. No, you can't. Here's a maximum for you. There is no one loop that can cover all bands effectively. It, you may need to build more than one if you want to cover more than one band. But the glossy advertisement that says we'll cover all bands is not true. But by overlooking some of the factors for the mag loop, that's what leads to disappointment. And believe me, even some of the, the commercial guys overlook some of the factors for maybe reasons we don't agree with. All right, here are the mag loop optimizing factors. Conductor diameter, the shape of the loop, the material you build it out of, the size of the loop, the matching method and the tuning method. All of those characteristics for every loop that you build must be maximized as much as possible. Otherwise, you're not going to have satisfying results. So the objective of this presentation is to explore those unique factors and to show you an inexpensive example, a PVC and foil tape optimized loop, which I call the epicenter loop, meaning that it's probably a design that it will be as useful as possible to the largest number of users. You might build bigger or smaller loops for specific needs, but this one is a kind of a general purpose. I call it the epicenter loop. All right, factor one, the conductor diameter. And believe me, if you learn nothing else from this presentation than this one point, you've learned a lot. This is the biggie. And here it is as a kind of a maximum. Mag loops must have big conductors. There's no way around it. It's basic physics. Here's a typical three foot magnetic loop. I chose this, I chose this size because and shape, it's a round loop. I chose this size and shape because it's pretty typical of a lot of loops you see built in art from articles or commercial loops. But look here on this graph. I did a careful study and evaluated the efficiency of a three foot diameter circular loop made out of four different sizes of conductor from AG10 wire, which some hams might think, oh, I can do that. I'll put it inside of a PVC frame up to inch and a half diameter for a three foot loop. I also show the red line. This is the most popular commercial loop, the MFJ loop. And then some hams think, because a lot of articles suggest it, that you can build a good loop out of RG8 coax. No, you can't. Take a look here at the, this chart, which shows you the efficiency of every one of these choices from 100% to 0% for over the whole range from zero, zero frequency up to the top of 10 meters. And it shows you where we enter the low efficiency zone which is the pink zone here. I've set it arbitrarily at 50%. A 50% loss in, in performance is a loss, but it's only one S point at the receive end. That's probably tolerable. Below that, loss becomes unacceptable. But notice the frequency at which these various diameters of the conductor, which is point number one here, loses the ability to be at least 50% efficient. An inch and a half pipe for this loop will get you down to about eight, nine megahertz. The commercial loop will get down to about 11 megahertz minimum. That's why MFJ advertises this as only going to 14 megahertz. It's, the MFJ loop does not, does not go to seven megahertz or below. It can get it down there with a tuning capacitor, but the efficiency will be utterly terrible. And notice, notice the RG8, which a lot of people think is a great thing to make a loop out of. No, it'll only go down to about 17 megahertz. Anything below that, your loss is too much. And of course, nobody's foolish enough to make a mag loop out of 10 gauge wire because there we're up about 25 megahertz is the lowest you can go before the loop goes in the dumper. Here's, a, here's another similar graph. This is the one I did now for the sample loop that I'm gonna show you here in a minute or two couple of minutes anyway. And you'll see it's a little bit better than the three foot 
three foot circular loop. This is a four foot square loop. And you'll notice that the four foot square loop, if you make it out of two inch pipe, will make it down to 40 meters uh, with an efficiency of 50% or better. RG8 will make it down to about uh, 11 megahertz and 10 gauge wire won't make it down uh, to uh, more about 16 megahertz. Clearly, a four inch square loop needs to be made out of two inch pipe. There really is no choice. Here's the 50% mark where the efficiency is too low for practical use for most users. That's why I consider in a four foot loop, the optimum diameter is two inches. Nothing less will work efficiently. Now, I know you can tune these loops. In fact, most of these commercial rigs uh, tuners that you buy with the thing will take you down to seven megs if you want to. You can get it to a lower band because uh, it's a low SWR, but low SWR has says nothing about efficiency and you'll get little performance if you tune below the, the minimum. Here's a maximum. No mag loop can effectively work all HF bands. Never forget this. Don't go out and pay $800 for the top, the top brand of commercial loop and think you're going to work all bands with it. You're not. You're only going to work 20 meters to 15 meters. Other than that, its efficiency goes to heck. Here's the MFJ loop. It has high, loop, high loss below 20 meters and nothing on 10 meters. And it costs $700. Here's the actual loss figures for the magnetic, for the MFJ loop, showing you that it's only reasonable from 15 meters to 40, uh, and, and down to 10 meters, maybe at a stretch, seven, uh, seven megahertz. So point number one, optimization number one diameter, and this is the long one, and this is the most, but it's the most important one. High loss due to small conductors is the chief mistake of all magnetic loop builders, including some of the commercial designers. Why? Why does a mag loop need big conductors? It's simple. Skin effect. Skin effect doesn't use the center of the conductor. You haven't got a lot of conductive area except in a big diameter pipe. You've got to make the pipe big so that the amount of conductive area on the surface is big enough to keep the efficiency up. It's just simple physics. But why is that bad? Well, it is because of efficiency. Power lost compared to power radiated. Here's a little diagram of the circuit of all antennas, four elements, the two reactances, inductance and capacitance, and two resistances, two real resistances measured in ohms. Conductor resistance, that's just the simple, simple ohmic resistance of the conductor, and a thing called radiation resistance. What's radiation resistance? It's just the loading of space on the antenna. It's the place where your power goes. These two guys use no power. These are the guys that consume power. And it's a ratio of these two that determines efficiency. Conductor resistance is the bad guy. What does it do? It converts your transmitter power into heat. And if the conductor resistance is high in an antenna, most of your power goes to heat, and that's not making contact. It's the radiation resistance that does the work. It's what makes the radio waves. So in any loop, or any antenna for that matter, the radiation resistance needs to be high and the conductor resistance comparatively low. That's hard to achieve in a magnetic loop unless you make the conductors very large in comparison to the diameter of the loop. So it's in a ratio of the two. It's the uh, this ratio is the enemy, all small antennas, if you don't make the conductors big enough. Because conductor resistance goes down, of course, as you make an antenna smaller, but it goes down linearly or directly. So a half size antenna has half the conductor resistance. But the radiation resistance of a small antenna goes down as the square. So a half size antenna only has a quarter of the wanted resistance. So the efficiency ratio is a half if you take the size down to a half. Okay, so you wanna fix something in your mind. You wanna get a mental 
picture of something in your mind when you're thinking of any Magaloop, whether a commercial one to buy or a, one of the fancy article on the internet on how to make one. You want to fix this picture in your mind. And if the loop you see doesn't match this, you're not going to have an efficient loop. And here's my little sample loop, some of which have been built so far, and results have been good. A mag loop, if you fix this picture in your mind, all mag loops need to look something like this. They can be round if you want them to be, but they need to have these proportions. The diameter of the conductors compared to the diameter of the loop needs to be no less than 24 to one. Meaning if you've got a four foot loop, it needs at least two inch conductors to be efficient down to its lower frequency. And this is true of all loops. So keep this picture in your mind when you're gonna buy a loop or gonna build a loop. If it doesn't have conductors that look that fat, it's not a good loop. For 40 meters, for 40 meters, you need two inch pipe. For 80 meters, you need an eight foot loop with, eight, with four inch pipe. Ooh, four inch pipe, that's big stuff. But how about a 160 meter loop? You're gonna to need to build a 116 foot loop with eight inch diameter pipe. How much is that gonna cost you? A fortune. All right, that's enough on that quickly. Factor two, loop shape. This is one that, this is one that surprised me. The magnetic loop got into the ham world in 1968, following an, following an article, uh, uh, by an article written by Lou McCoy, now a silent key luminary of ham radio. He wrote a lot of good stuff. The loop had been invented two years earlier by Kenneth Patterson for the army for the use in Vietnam. And it was McCoy that picked up on this and wrote this article for QST in 68. I remember reading this article. And that particular loop was 12 foot in diameter, used eight five foot bolted together square sections with three variable capacitors to do the tuning and the matching. And this became an instant hit in the ham world. You can, by the way, get that article if you want to off the article archive and on QST. But the thing about the army loop and ham radio, and it all started right here, the shape of the loop got stuck in the mind of, ham, of hams. Most hams think magnetic loops should be round or at least octagonal. And they don't really think about any other shape. A few do, but mostly hams think of round or octagonal loops. They think that's what you got to do. But that is not the optimum shape. In fact, the army still uses them. Here's the army loop as it's currently used. Uh, it's uh, made by the Harris Company, and it's a two-turn loop, as you can see. Michael Faraday, way back in the 19th century, who was very interested in small magnetic loops, did some pioneering research in small loops, which went into Maxwell's equations. Uh, he discovered that a small loop antenna works only by its area. It does not care what its shape is. So these shapes, if the area is the same, all work the same. Some people think that a circle is the per perfect shape. No, it's not. A square loop is only four and a half inches bigger than a round loop with the same area. That's not, a, that's not significant. It's not, that's not worth the powder and shot to blow it up because a round loop is hard to build, especially if you're going to build it with high efficiency in large diameter pipe, which that one on the left is not a high efficiency loop. It does not have the 24 to one ratio. That one's about a hundred to one ratio. And there's the octagonal one, again, with the conductors too small. And, uh, and of course, made out of copper pipe. It's dreadfully expensive with all those elbows. Octagonal, expensive elbows. Frankly, optimizing the mag loop is to make it square. That one on the right is at least a square loop. It's at least optimized in that one way. And to me, it's the optimum shape for all magnetic loops. Don't bother with round or octagonal, make them square. Factor number three, the construction material. Everybody, pretty much all hams know what skin effect is. It's the fact that the RF current runs on the surface of a conductor. We've already talked about this a little, but there's no, no current on the inside 
of the conductor. And this one is a pretty good picture of the of where the RF current is in a round conductor. There's nothing on the inside, but that's an advantage because the center of the conductor isn't needed. We could use a hollow tube and it will still work as well. Or we can use a plastic tube and put aluminum foil on the outside of it. Because look at how thin the skin is. On 80 meters, it's 1.7 thousandths of an inch in aluminum and 1.4 thousandths of an inch in copper. Not much difference, but pretty, pretty, pretty small, isn't it? That's thin. Everything except the first 1.4, 1 1.7 or 1.4 thousandths of an inch is wasted material. You don't need it. It could be a vacuum and the thing would work just as well. What does that mean? We can build magnetic loops out of foil tape, aluminum or copper. In fact, they're both very, sim very similar. But what does it do for the optimization of expense? Well, you need to build my little four foot example loop. You're gonna need two lengths of inch and a half PVC pipe, which I just priced this at Home Depot a couple of days ago, 1578 for each length. So you can buy the material for the loop for about $30. If you wanted to build it in copper, which a lot of hams think you gotta build magnetic loops out of copper pipe. If you're gonna build a four foot square loop loop out of, out of inch, and a, inch and a half or inch and a quarter, uh, half inch copper pipe, it's gonna cost you $256 for the material. That's not optimization. That's why I say PVC and foil is the optimized magnetic loop, not copper pipe. You might think, well, aluminum is not as good as copper. Yes, it is. It's 40% less conductive, but it has a thicker skin. So copper and aluminum are absolutely equal building materials for the efficiency of an antenna. Factor three, how big do you make the loop? Okay, here's a very well-known big magnetic loop built in Italy. And you can see it here. Uh, it's actually a well, pretty well-designed loop. Still the diameter of the conductor is a bit small, but uh, uh, for a high efficiency. But you may wanna build a bigger loop to get you down to lower frequency, but a big loop, the size of the loop is awkward. That's not an easy loop to handle or an easy loop to turn or even an easy loop to put up. It's an awkward loop. And besides, what are the neighbors gonna think of that loop? The neighbor sticking his head over the fence uh, is gonna say, get that ugly thing out of my backyard. And the thing most loop builders don't recognize is that that loop has a maximum frequency and it's not 10 meters. That loop is no, that loop is, is no good except on 40 meters and down. What's the highest usable frequency in a magnetic loop? Here's the square, square loop that I advocate as optimum. That loop has a natural inductance and a natural capacity, even without a tuning capacitor. It's the self-resonant frequency of that loop. Make a loop, put a, put a gap in the top of it, feed it, it's in any way that's that's a good way to feed it and then hook your analyzer on it with no capacitor at all and you'll get a big strong dip that's at the self-resonant frequency that's the highest frequency that that loop can be used so the particular four foot loop that i'm showing has a natural resonant frequency of about 31 and a half megahertz meaning if we can get up to 10 meters with a four foot loop can't get to six meter with it I don't care what the ads say, they won't go there. The top frequency of a magnetic loop is determined by its self-induct, self-resonant frequency. So on 30, 32 megs for a four foot loop, which will get you to 10 meters, 16 megs for an eight foot loop, which will get you to 20 meters maximum, and a 16 foot loop, which will, which will only let you go to 40 meters maximum. That's approximately what that Manzioni loop that I showed you in the previous slide will go to. There's another size limit, which some, some hams get all worried about and they're afraid to depart from. They believe the, the thing that gets pumped out on website after website, and believe me, it's not true, that a loop must be less in size, less in circumference than a 10th of a wavelength. That is not so, and I'm gonna show it to you. And in fact, they even give you dire warnings. If you buy, if you buy a mag loop calculator or get a copy of it, 
uh, off the web, which is free, uh, they'll tell you don't make it bigger than, and they, they say 0 0.33 in circumference. But, uh, and most sites will say 0.1. Is this true? Do you need to keep your magnetic loop smaller than a tenth of a wavelength in circumference? No. Faraday, one of the reasons they, one of the reasons they, they think it, it's true is because they think a, a magnetic loop is insensitive, insensitive to, to vertical polarized signals. Well, it is, but only in the local near field, which is relatively small. It will have nothing to do with getting rid of the noise from the power lines that are three miles away from you. It's as, it's as noisy an antenna as is a dipole. Interference must be within the near field. And for 80 media, this is only about 200 feet. All sizes of magnetic loops from very small to very large will work. But a lot of people, I, I, one of my lectures guy said, well, you don't want to make it bigger than a tenth of wavelength because we'll get rid of that, those beautiful nulls that you can use to, that you can use to null out noise with. Well, here's the radiation pattern of a tenth wavelength loop showing you the, showing you the radiation pattern. And you can see the gray nulls that exist. The vertical is the red, the horizontal is the green. And by the way, it has double polarization. Uh, and that's typical of most square loops. Uh, but you see the nice neat nulls? A lot of hams think if you don't make it a tenth of wavelength, it's gonna lose those nulls. Will it? Okay, let me show it to you. I did a workup on this one. Here's a loop at a tenth of a wavelength in circumference. Here's the same loop at two tenths of a wavelength in circumference. This is a four foot loop, by the way. I mean, no, this would be an eight foot loop now. But anyway, if you make a loop two tenths of a wavelength in, there's the radiation pattern. Where are the nulls? They're still there. They still look the same. Here's a loop that's three tenths of a wavelength in diameter. Are the, are the nulls gone? No, nope, the nulls are still there. You can build a three foot loop and use it as a noise canceling loop just as well. A four tenths loop. Where are they? How come the how come the nulls aren't going away? As a lot of people say, it will happen. It what doesn't happen? Here's a half wavelength in diameter loop. Still has the nulls. Here's a six tenths, a seven tenths, uh, at eight tenths of a wavelength around. Almost a full wavelength around that, and that's a big loop for most frequencies. Finally, do you lose the nulls? You begin to lose them, and it isn't until you get to a nine tenths circumference wavelength loop, do you lose the nulls entirely and you lose the horizontal polarization too. <laughs> so don't believe it if you go to build a magnetic loop. Don't believe the articles that say it's got to be under a tenth of a wavelength. It doesn't. You can make it all the way up to seven tenths of a wavelength in diameter for the, for the highest frequency you can uh, uh, for the... Uh... Anyway, there it is at one full wavelength. So the frequency range is determined by the self resonant. That's the maximum you can go. And the minimum frequency is, the, is determined by the efficiency of the loop. This is why MFJ says our, our famous loop is only good from 20 meters to 15 meters. Outside of that, it isn't that good. So don't believe the glossy ads. And there are dozens of them say, oh, our wonderful loop will tune all bands. No, it won't. No mag loop can work all HF bands. All of them must have fat conductors and must be the right size. All right, here's my loop. Here's a, here's a sort of a drafting of it. You can see what it looks like. I've made it shortened here with the ellipses in there so that you can see the details of it. All built out of PVC pipe, inch and a half PVC pipe covered with aluminum foil, including the, including the corners. You have to cut the corners in half uh, vertically, so you get two two half shells. And as uh, my good buddy uh, W6OA pointed out, you put the aluminum foil on the inside to maintain the con conductivity of the loop. And there's the matching network at the bottom, made of three pieces of half inch aluminum tubing flattened on the end so that they can be bolted together. They're fed from that uh, PL SL239 jack there with a couple little short pieces of wire and then over to a host a a a, a, a u-bolt uh, on the uh, on the main loop 
with this particular matching network, you can match it anywhere you put this loop. You, do, you might think there, where's the tuning capacitor? Oh, it's there. And here's the loop, the actual loop in my backyard. How about putting the tape on? This is a little tough. I'll, I'll go quickly through this. Take a piece of the four inch wide tape uh, and fold back a, about an inch on each end, remove the, remove the backing and stick it down onto a piece of carpet and then remove the rest of the backing uh, so that you can expose the glue. And then very carefully push your pipes down onto the, onto the aluminum foil. Yeah, it's pretty tough to put this on. Don't try to do it any other way or you'll get it all wrinkled and crinkled. Do it this way and then you can get it pretty good. Because as soon as you get that pipe onto the loop, you can't move it after that. Then you roll it back and forth to get it started. Then you snip the ends off and roll it on completely. And you'll get a nice application of the aluminum or copper tape if, you're, if you want to spend the money for copper, which you don't need to. Inside the elbows, you need to cut yourself a little, a little L of the aluminum tape, still with the backing on it. And uh, I found that it helps if you make it at a slight angle, 100 degrees instead of 90 degrees. Then by a little bit of careful application, you can, you can slowly remove the backing and stick it on a bit by bit until you get it all pressed into the, all pressed into the elbows. And this is what it looks like with the aluminum tape all pressed into the elbows. The pipes themselves have tape on the end of them. They come in and they mate with those, those half circles that you see there on the end and make a good contact at the end. And you hold the, and you hold the two halves, halves of, the, of, the, of the elbow together with sheet metal screws or bolts, if you wish. Take caution though, be careful when you're putting that foil inside the, the elbows, be careful not to split it as you go over the sharp edges. Be, uh, do not split the tape, it splits pretty easily. All right, the tuning capacitor. Here's my current version of the tuning capacitor. It's another piece of pipe inside of the loop. You don't, that's why I didn't see it in the previous picture. It's a piece of one inch PVC pipe uh, expanded, uh, that's half the width of the loop, roughly half the width of the loop, that can be slid with a couple of, of a pair, paracords attached to the end, slid from one end to the other uh, across the gap in the middle. There's a piece of, there's a piece of braid which attaches the, the, the one end of, the, of that sliding capacitor plate to the end of the loop. So the sliding capacitor plate and the, and the outer shell are connected together uh, uh, and, the, and the sliding, the foil on the outside. And by the way, there's foil on the outside of the, of the, of the big loop and foil on the outside of the sliding making the other plate of the capacitor. But that, that foil on the inside piece is connected to the outside by a piece of braid taken out of a piece of RG8 and then brought out halfway down there, as you see it, and hooked and, and just taped to the uh, outside. So the, uh, to give you the capacity you need. If you slide that capacitor all the way to one end, the gap is completely free of it. Uh, the, the capacitor is completely free of it, and there's no there's no capacity there. But if you slide it all the way to the other end, you get the maximum capacity. This capacitor will tune this four foot loop that I'm showing you anywhere from above 10 meters to below 40 meters. So, and you can just do tuning just by pulling the wire. How much is this going to cost compared to a vacuum variable? How much is this going to cost compared to a Big rotary capacitor, which by the way has high losses, so uh, it's going to cost very little. Here's the here's the inner inner plate of the of the sliding capacitor with aluminum on the surface, and the one end expanded here with some cardboard wrapped around it to make it bigger, or you can use that big thick double sided uh, tape to do it with as well, or or you can use uh, the covers off of plastic notebooks, expand it out so that it makes it up to about inch and a half, a, a, a fairly snug fit inside the pipe. Need this, need that expanded in to get enough capacity. And here's some actual graphs that I took of my, my loop showing you the, the, the tuning when you've got it slid to one end on the right, it'll tune well, way above 10 meters. So your maximum frequency is above 10 meters, which is the gray area here. 
And if you slide it all the way to the other end, it'll it'll tune down to below below the 70, the seven megahertz band. You might say, well, that's high SWR. Well, I just didn't adjust it to one to one, but you certainly can. Here's one of the here's one of the end end uh, end elbows. You can see it's cut in half vertically. I used the bandsaw, and it's bolted or screwed onto the main loop with number 12 sheet metal screws, or you can use bolts if you wish. And the cord passes through a hole in the in the elbow. Uh, one of my one of my viewers who built this, uh, Denny, uh, uh, he uh, used a sewing machine bobbin for the uh, for a pulley in the end, so he can fold the paracord back and tie tie the two ends together with a, with a piece of tie wrap, and uh, and make a little logging scale. As Denny says, it's uh, it's easy to tune this. You just move the tie wrap until it's on the mark, and you're tuned. Some people have suggested, why don't you use the old, why don't you just use the old uh, uh, tuning dial cord method that we used to use in radios back in the 40s, and uh, use a, a stepper motor at the end to move the uh, to move the uh, inner capacitor. Sure, you can if you want to, no problem. The advantages of this loop, though, compared to any of the other loop, is you don't need any weatherproofing for it. It's protected naturally from the weather, and it has a very high voltage rating. The, the PVC uh, it, uh, of the outside loop is thick enough to be way above the maximum voltage you're going to get on the, on the lowest frequency. By the way, the maximum voltage isn't the lowest frequency in a, in a loop. And I did a workup on it, and it's 2,000 volts for this particular sample loop. OK, matching the loop. Here's the three way, ways commonly used. A small loop, a small to make a, an RF transformer out of it. It's just an RF transformer. The primary is the small loop, and the secondary is the mag, mag loop itself. Some some other people match it with a toroid, which it works. Uh, it doesn't need as much. It doesn't need as big a coil to do a, to make the proper to matching. And some people actually match uh, magnetic loops with gamma matches. What's wrong with these? Why don't I consider either any of these optima? The little simple loop like this is flimsy. It works very well. You can get a good match very easily, but it's a fussy way to do it. In the, in the middle, using a toroid, well, it'll work, but you're going to have a lot more calculating to do to get the right kind and the right size toroid and the right size piece of wire through it. Uh, so the, the, the toroid match will work, uh, but not, uh, but, but it's not easy to do. Uh, by the way, notice that this loop is made out of a piece of our G8 coax. This also is a non-optimal loop. N no one of these three loops is optimal. The conductor's too small. And on the right is a, is a, is a, a gamma match, difficult match. Okay, here's the loop again. And here's the equivalent circuit of the match that I, I like to use. You can see it's an RF cap transformer. The coil in the capacitor on the right is the is the main loop, and the little adjustable thing on there seen on the loop is just the tap of the coil. We're all familiar with this technique of matching the impedance of a tuned circuit this way, and it works very well. And with this particular setup here, with that stainless U bolt, if you need it. You may not need it, but uh, if you have it, and with the uh, three 14 inch long pieces of uh, half inch pipe flattened at the end for bolts, you can put this loop anywhere you want it and you can get it into tune. So the universal optimized loop or what I call the epicenter loop. Uh, yeah, of course, you might build bigger ones for lower frequency. You might build smaller ones because you only want upper frequency. But the kind of universal loop in my view, it the conductor Conductor diameter is two inches. The shape of the loop is square, not round or octagonal, uh, and it's four feet on a side. Actually, I find it's about 45 inches on a side to get enough to get the highest frequency. And the material, make it out of aluminum or copper foil tape on PVC pipe because you don't need the copper inside of the pipe. And the tune it, match it, do it the way I showed you. So if you build one of these, these optimized loops, send me some pictures. I, I love them. 
Denny, uh, your host uh, for this uh, presentation, uh, K5DCC, made the first contacts with the loop. I, I, this, I, I said it was FT8. It's not. I think you did it on Whisper, didn't you? Anyway, yes, yes. Uh, he, yeah. made, he made these contacts, uh, uh, and uh, I was quite impressed. <laughs> I haven't developed it yet. I'm only thinking about it, but there's some definite advantage to making mag loops multi-turn. If you make them multi-turn, as you see here, and this is an easy neck uh, uh, simulation of it, with the one with the one turn made a bit higher so that you can get over the top of the other two, barely see the gap in it. This is a three turn loop, but it, it'll tune up just as fine. The advantage here is the radiation resistance, the good guy goes up as the square of the number of turns. So, uh, so a twice diameter, twice uh, a two turn loop would have twice the efficiency of a one term loop. A, th a three turn loop will have three times the efficiency uh, as, as, a, as a one turn loop because the conductor length goes up as directly or as the efficiency goes, uh, the radiation resistance goes up as the square. Therefore the total, the total efficiency for a one turn loop is twice as great for a two turn loop and twice and three times as great for a three turn loop and so forth. And, and you, but by the way, you need to make them an odd number of turns so that you get a good easy match. The matching doesn't work well with an, with an even number of turns. You can do it, but it's more awkward. And that's it. You can get um, you can get to me with that with that QR code there at the upper right, or there's my email address, uh, jfortune at aol.com, or you can go to my website w6nbc dot com and reach me there. And this is my little dog, doggy Lolly. She's a Shih Tzu. No, she doesn't have a German call sign. I just like to pretend that she does. And that's all, folks. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I'm thrilled with your design, and I've had a lot of fun building my own. I started out, as you know, with four foot one, and I didn't even have your plans. It was just listening to you in our sessions here, and I was blown away with how efficient it was. Well, then, as you know, I like to go portable. My little Prius doesn't hold a four foot loop, square loop very efficiently. So I hacked it down to a three foot and it works fantastic. The SWR is all down nice and low and I'm very excited about it. Now I noticed that you do it all in theory in the beginning. So you use Easy Neck. Uh, explain a little bit more about how Easy Neck works. I've taken a look at it and it's, it's very confusing to me. <laughs> yes, there is a pretty heavy learning curve, but there is for any one of the several available uh, antenna modeling programs, which work on NEC modeling, numerical electronic code modeling. Uh, they, they're, they're a graphic program. You get inside and you draw the loop or the antenna, whatever it is. You just do, it's drawn by using a coordinate table and you put in it beginnings and ends and you you make a physical picture a physical uh, sample model of the loop then when uh, then when you put in the frequency range for it to scan it'll actually do all the plots and everything you want for you show you where the swr low and a lot of other good information there are several good there are several good uh antenna modeling programs out there Easy Neck is now free, by the way, in case you don't know that. And the professional version is free. I not only have the professional version, I have the one that Livermore Labs wrote for the uh, for the four level, but uh, that's that'll still cost you if you want to have it. But the but the professional version of Easy Neck is readily available. It's called Easy Neck Seven, I think. You can download it from EasyNeck.com. There's also another very good one called Four Neck Two. Uh, which is much more graphical. Uh, I like it for its graphics, makes you nice 3D models. You can see, I'm just so used to Easy Neck that I stick with it. Uh, I learn, I learn tremendously with Easy Neck because when I get a wild brainstorm for a new antenna, first thing I do is model it, and then the first thing I do in Easy Neck is I, as I, as I keep making changes to it because they have easy way to make changes and do sweeps. And you can see what ha happens as you change things. And the light has lit up a dozens of time for me 
inside of EasyNet. So it's an antenna modeling program. My single most favorite of, of all time ham radio programs, if you want to design antennas. <laughs> and it and does. It's it's, and it's all math, it's, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've found this a little app that I downloaded and installed on in my Windows machine, and it's a, a, a loop calculator. You put in all the parameters, it tells oh yeah, you the efficiency. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, that's called uh, loop calc. Yeah. Loop, yeah, loop calc. Just search for loop, loop calc on the internet, and you'll come up with it. And that's, in fact, the very program I use to, to make those tables of efficiency. And it'll yep. tell you exactly. And just get on there. Just get on there. T take a loop. You think, oh, I'm going to buy that GGQ loop or whatever it is. Yeah. It says it'll tune everything from 10 meters to, to 200 meters or whatever. Don't believe yep. them. Yep. Make, a model, yep. make a model of it in easy neck and see if it'll tune all those frequencies and see what the efficiency is. Use uh, a loop calc and, 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 and put it in there. And you'll see that the efficiencies go in the toilets at, yeah. at, uh, at, at bigger sizes or small conductors. You'll quickly realize with these calculators, I can't build a good mag loop out of RG8 coax. I'm going yeah. to need two inch, two inch pipe. And I'm not going to build it out of copper pipe. That'll break the bank. I'm going yeah. to build it out of PVC and foil. And they work just as well as Denny has found out. My next project is to build one for six meters. Now my three foot one, it covers 17 meters through 10 meters up to the FM portion of 10 meters, very, very nicely. But above that, I can't quite make it to 20 meters. So I'm gonna use your method of maybe bridging that gap at the top with a capacitor and then using the tube to fine tune it. So I'm hoping that'll work, but uh, can't get to six meters. The uh, natural we'll resonance there. is 39 we'll megahertz. Yeah. I'll get out. I'll get out easy neck and try a six meter loop here. <laughs> Very good. Well, we've got one of your buddies in here too, Jim W six O E K, who is uh, kind of one of your support partners in crime. Here, he builds a lot of your antennas and tests them out. Jim, why don't you bring up your video and say hello to uh, the folks here? And how did you two meet? Your mic is muted. You're muted. That's all right. Through our, our amateur radio club, the satellite amateur radio club here at Vandenberg Air Force Base. I think that's where we first met. And you have a background in uh, engineering, I think, don't you? Uh, not, a, not an extensive background, but I have been, uh, I, I was employed as an engineer and, uh, and a supervisor for, uh, for maintenance in, in a local uh, uh, electronics company. Okay, very good. And for those that don't know you, John, so much, uh, fill us in a little bit more about your career and what what you did for a living. Well, I went to university and became degreed in physics. <laughs> that was my background. Uh, then I uh, then I started working a variety of jobs, never much in physics, until I finally landed a job uh, uh, for a, a video production company in Hollywood. And then ultimately that took me over to KNBC Los Angeles, where I spent quite a quite a long time as a as a video technician, really, engineer, helping another in a group of guys who kept that studio running technically. So my yep. background is in broadcast engineering. And eventually I made my way after they shut down their training department at NBC. I moved over to Sony Electronics in the Bay Area and moved up to the Bay Area where I worked for Sony Electronics in, in San Jose uh, in, their, in their video, in their video products, professional video products division, and taught dozens and dozens of classes in how to maintain and repair professional video VCRs and cameras and all sorts of other Sony professional video equipment. Well, and how long have you been a ham? Since 1967. Oh, that's about when I got my license too. Yeah, 1967. I when did your love of building? What was that, Jim? I said I beat your awe. Oh, I was uh, first licensed in 1957. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, John, when did your love of designing antennas start? I don't know if I can put a, a hard date to it, but uh, uh, but if I think back all through ham radio, my ham radio experience, 
it always seemed like the the uh, the antennas always captured my attention. They seemed so mysterious, and slowly they become less and less mysterious. And with the help of EasyNeck and various other calculators, I, I feel I have a much better handle on antennas now. Although it was a it was a simple little 10 watt AM simple 10 watt AM uh, transmitter uh, that I built from a from a British magazine article while I was living in, in England uh, to work top banner 10 meters. And I used that the heck out of that little transmitter, even mobile. <laughs> you imagine 10, wow. watts of, 10 watts of AM in your car from a little, a tiny little highly inefficient whip on the back of the car. Uh, I made all sorts of contacts with that. <laughs> wow. And Jim, how many of his antennas have you made? Quite a few. I'm, I've made a few. <laughs> <laughs> Only the ones that got published in QST. <laughs> I get a wild, I get a wild hair on a new antenna. I go home and I build it, and then I bring it into our our meeting at the A Street Cafe every Tuesday. And uh, Jim and I sit there, and he tells me what I did wrong. <laughs> then I go back and then I go back and and do it. Oh, we got wait, there's another very highly uh, educated fellow there too, uh, W two W two D U who is a wonderful uh, physicist type. And he tells me a lot about it, gives me great ideas. And this, this, this optimized mag loop has got ideas from all three of us in it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you've had several articles published in QST. How many of them and how many were rejected? I've had 29 published and I think 16 rejected. So uh, we should... Uh, so I understand now from our session this morning, you have plans of maybe putting it all together in an ebook, all of them? Yes. Well, as we all know, and I'm, I'm a very dedicated member of the ARRL, but uh, Newington is conservative. That's for the part of the country they're from. And they, they don't publish anything that's a little off the edge in terms of a, a little bit strange. They want nice middle of the road, uh, you know, you know, blue and apple pie uh, antennas. So uh, some of these off the wall ones that I have, that they've rejected, including one Jim and I just, just finished, he did most of the work on it, on a 10 meter uh, mag loop, a, ma a slot cube, 10 meter slot cube. Uh, they didn't accept it either and we were surprised. Uh, but I think I'll, since I've done so well with the uh, Kindle ebook on slot antennas, which is readily available, slot antennas for ham radio. I'm going to now do one on all of the all of the rejected articles from QST. <laughs> yeah. And some of them are lots of fun, as I was showing you earlier this morning. A, yep. a Lincoln hat, it was an actual yeah. antenna, and, and a couple of interesting spoofs that they did, wouldn't publish. Only had yeah. one spoof ever published in QST, and that was on Monax. Monodirectional coax. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, uh, my first introduction to you and your work was at the slot antenna with aluminum foil tape. And I've still got mine right up there in the window put on plexiglass. Oh, and yeah. And I haven't got anything that outperforms it. And it only costs pennies. <laughs> it only costs pennies. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for. Uh, uh, working together and allowing me to be part of your group. I love getting together each week and uh, I love building your projects and uh, it's, it's taught me an awful lot about antennas and I've always been just a little uh, weak on understanding antenna theory but it's making a lot more sense now so appreciate all you do and uh, looking forward to hearing from you about that six meter version. I'd like to like to build one of those. So we'll say seven three. And if you want to uh, follow uh, John and his work, uh, go to his website, which was shared earlier. I'm sure he'll post his link to his complete list of antenna designs with his ebook on Amazon. So God bless y'all. Happy Memorial Day. <laughs>